Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Even Nutrition Radio. Thank you so much for listening and for actually coming back every single week to be here with us. Um, if you're new, my name is Andres Ayesa, registered dietitian and nutrition coach. Uh, of course, there's a chance that you may be watching this on YouTube, or if you're actually like driving or something, there's likely you're obviously listening to this in the Apple Podcast, Google Play, or Spotify. I just wanted to say thank you so much for uh, listening to it and for giving us your support. Today's podcast was a different one, and I was super excited about it because of my guest that I got to bring in. Um, one of my friends, Desi, he actually does a lot of our chit-chat series with us. Um, he told me about this guy, um, and he said, you should bring him into the podcast because he is a professional eater, um, and uh, he's also uh, in, the, in, in the path to become a registered dietitian. I was like, whoa, those two things together, that's insane. So um, I guess like we are in a way professional eaters or we are professionals who teach people how to eat. But anyways, I wanted to actually introduce my guest here today. His name is Randy Santel. Uh, Randy is a professional eater from St. Louis, Missouri and here in the United States. And he focused strictly on winning and promoting restaurant food challenges and challenges all around the world. Uh, he currently has about 50 wins in all 50 states and 37 countries. Um, and I believe in, the, in, the, in today's podcast, he talked about actually winning or uh, beating about 846 challenges. Um, and he won't be stop, stopping anytime soon. He focused heavily on nutrition and also on fitness. Uh, so he's able to kind of stay lean and well over winning 100 challenges per year on average. Of course, it's a lot more than that, I feel like. Um, he has the most challenge wins of out of all eaters past and present around the world and gap would only grow larger um, he's the owner and operator of a website called foodchallenges.com and he includes a full database of all current restaurant eating challenges available in 50 countries around the world uh, with over 100 articles teaching people how to train strategize and dominate them all today's episode obviously could be polarizing for many people because and obviously you hear some of like the thoughts and some of the things that you actually cover. Uh, but it was a really interesting conversation. And I think it's really interesting to see a different perspective as far as like eating and um, his perspective on some of the different things. As I mentioned, he is in the path to become a registered dietitian because eventually when he's done with his food challenges, he wants to continue to educate people. But I'll let you actually listen to the full episode here um, with uh, Randy Santel. And I'll see you guys in the next week. Again, hopefully you enjoy it. Make sure that you remember that if you're not really following us and others, um, our other social media channels, uh, make sure that you do so. Um, links are all in the show notes and looking forward to chat and teach you more in different ways. Thank you guys so much for listening. See you guys next week. Enjoy this episode. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to another Viva Nutrition Radio episode. Um, I am pretty excited to have our podcast guest here today. His name is Randy Sintel. You may have seen him in the past if you actually are a YouTuber or you like YouTube because this guy, you're probably going to see him do food challenges, but I'm going to let him talk all about that in today's podcast. And I'm super excited to uh, have you, Randy. Welcome to the show, man. What's going on? Hey, thanks for having me on. This will be fun. You don't get to talk to male registered dietitians too much. So, yeah, we we're talking about that. Uh, we're trying to kind of hit. We're trying to hit that 50, 50 registered dietitian mark, like every time that we kind of have a conference, right? Yes. Yeah. And I'm just people listening. I'm not an official registered dietitian yet. I've just completed my didactic program at Missouri State University. I'm taking a couple years off. Uh, before I do my internship, but I'm looking to start my internship in August of 2021. I'm not sure where I'm going to do it at yet, but uh, once I complete that, I'll take the test and I'll become a dietitian. That's awesome. So you're what they call like RD to B's in the process. RD to B, yes. That's awesome, dude. Well, before we even kind of like get in the, because I would love to know when does this kind of like process start when you decided to become a dietitian? But before that, what are like, what are you known for? And, or like, uh, tell us a little bit more about like your story, kind of like sort of like the, your elevator pitch per, per se, and like exactly what you do and how you actually are where you're at today. Yeah. My name is Randy Santel. I'm a professional eater. I don't really go by the term competitive eater because those do more eating contests. I focus more on food challenges, which are like you'd watch on the show, man versus food if you ever watched that on the Travel Channel. But I started back in 2010, March 12th, no, March 19th, 2010 was my very first food challenge. And fast forward to today, I've got 846 wins in all 50 states and then in 37 countries. And then I'm looking to become 
uh, I got into my first degree actually was in 2008 and that was in construction management. I played college football at Missouri State University, mm -hmm. but then I kind of quickly realized that I wasn't really into construction management, which I did up until 2013. But in 2010, I won a national body transformation contest sponsored by Men's Health Magazine mm -hmm. and then the television series Spartacus. And then uh, a week after to celebrate the end of that long diet and exercise period, my buddy invited me to do a 28 inch pizza challenge in St. Louis, Missouri, where we're both from. And we ended up doing it and we won $500. And then I just started looking into everything from there. And I just started doing more and more food challenges and everything's kind of grown to what it is today. But I always knew that I wasn't going to be able to be just a professional leader. I knew there was going to have to be something after because you can't do food challenges forever. <laughs> Metabolism slows down and stuff like that. With that transformation contest, I started getting more into health and fitness and stuff. And I quickly realized how important nutrition was. And then I decided since there's not really too much, uh, there's not many dietitians on social media as far as video platforms. So I quickly realized that uh, that was something that I'd be able to kind of grow my social media with doing the food challenges and then transfer over to being a dietitian uh, once I was done with all that. That's amazing, dude. And, and thank you so much for sharing that because I was actually going to ask you about this because like, I watched one of your YouTube videos about the Spartacus and I was like, how did you kind of like get into that? Like, so this was like through that transformational, like when did you kind of have like your transformation challenge that you did? Yeah, I was always kind of, I played college football uh, where I ranged from like 295 to 330 pounds, just depending on how things were going. And then after I retired from football, I knew that I didn't need all that weight on me. So I kept on trying different things of trying to lose the weight and do this and do that. And then finally, I was looking through a men's health magazine and saw an advertisement for the transformation contest. It was halfway sponsored by men's health magazine and then halfway sponsored by Spartacus. And I knew that I was, I was right, right at uh, like 255 pounds. So I knew I was right at the right spot where in two, three months I would, ha I had enough, I had enough uh, room for improvement per se to be able to transform and get a six pack or whatever that I would need to win. But also too, um, I wasn't so big that I wouldn't be able to transform enough. So I kind of knew I was at a perfect spot for it. And I uh, ended up just going all in and, and going for it. And I ended up winning. That's awesome. And like this entire like professional eating, like, you know, obviously this is something that you do pretty much like full time. So, so how does, how does that, how do you go about it? So it's just typically for you, cause I'm super curious as to like, how do you actually kind of go from just doing it just for fun? Like, Hey, like let's just do a quick pizza challenge to now actually doing it, which I'm guessing you have, you know, a team or you kind of like travel different places, plan things out. So what does that look like for you right oh, now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, and it started out uh, definitely for fun. I didn't really know what I was doing or what I, the potential of everything and what it could all grow into back in 2010 when I started. But everybody back then was really into eating contests. And it was also the same time when uh, round one of Man versus Food was blowing up and there were food challenges at all these different restaurants and stuff like that. Everybody was focused on eating contests. All I really ever cared about was doing the food challenges. So it's always been my little niche that I've been doing, uh, just focused on doing food challenges all around. And I did the ones around Missouri that I knew of. Uh, my second one ever, I was the first person to complete an 18-inch deep dish pizza in Jefferson City. And I won $450 for that. But the cool thing was, was, my cousin, he just happened to be off the day that we were going to do that first team pizza challenge. And he just said, hey, if you idiots are going to do this, I'm going to go film it for you. And he came with me. And thankfully, he did because he needed to drive me home because I was feeling rough after eating like seven pounds of freaking pizza. And he ended up turning it into a video. I created a YouTube channel just to post the video on. And then a couple people watched it. And I figured, hey, since I filmed the first one, I might as well video the second. And then it just kind of kept on going from there. And the way to make money as a professional leader is definitely not the food challenges and eating contests themselves. It's definitely through all the social media. Yeah, so it's sense. just been, uh, there's never really been just one day that everything just shot up. Uh, it's just been consistent growth over time of, of doing it over 10 years now. Like I said, I started back in 2010. I've just been working on growing. We started with the YouTube channel and then uh, I think in like 2000 and 
we'll call it 2014, 2013, I really started focusing on the Facebook page, which we finally got monetized in 2018. So everything's been really well from yes. then. But yeah, it's just been uh, just constant consistency, just food challenges, food challenges, food challenges. And now we're up to over 1,060,000 uh, subscribers on YouTube. And then we're approaching 1.2 million followers on Facebook. So That's things amazing, are going really dude. well. That's awesome. I, and I guess like, you know, kind of like talking specifically about like the, this, like the food challenges that you do, how often do you do them? And like, do you consider yourself to kind of like be on like, and, and there's, we're going to, gonna, I'm going to try to break this down into, cause I want to talk obviously about health. I know I saw your, <clears throat> uh, an actual YouTube video that you posted about your blood work, which I was, it was mind blown to me. So I want to talk about this specifically about that, but why don't you kind of tell me, I'll tell like the audience a little bit more about like, okay, how often do you do this? Uh, do you have like a season in which you're actually more dedicated to doing this versus like times in which you're like, you know what, I'm going to take a, a little break as far as this. Yeah. And I'm definitely the most extreme. Uh, there's nobody that even really comes close uh, to doing as many events and food challenges and things as me. But also that's partially because I do have a team. I have two full-time editors. I have a team that helps with my event bookings and then some other stuff. Most of the YouTubers do everything themselves and they don't really put events together or anything like that. Uh, they just call up restaurants and say, hey, I want to do your challenge and then they post the video. And then they do all the editing themselves too. So they're not really able uh, it would be too much to do as many videos and stuff as, as I do. We post three videos a week. Uh, right after I graduated last May 2019, we ramped up to four videos a week, and that was just crazy. Uh, I was just gaining too much weight. I didn't have really any time to do anything so that's else. That's like four challenges per week that you were doing? That Yeah, we were posting, yeah, about four food challenges a week. But, um, yeah, where I was going with that is uh, back when I first started, 2010, I was still working in construction. So I was working my real job from uh, basically 2010 to 2013. I was working in construction management as an estimator, uh, basically a desk job. And then I would travel and go do food challenges on the weekends. Once uh, October 26, 2013, I retired from construction. I tore up all my resumes, deleted everything, and just was going to focus on becoming a YouTuber, basically. And then after that, I started going on tours. Uh, just because when you're going to other countries, other states, it's not feasible to, it's not economically even really possible unless you're just loaded with money to, to just spend all the money to go one place, do two challenges and come home and diet. So I was going on these longer tours, doing challenges almost every day. Uh, sometimes I would do two a day. So I would average sometimes like eight or nine a week. Wow. But then I would come home after a couple of weeks and then I would take a couple of weeks off. And then I would just diet and lose the weight. And that's kind of what I've been doing ever since. Uh, when I was in school, uh, construction management had absolutely nothing to do with dietetics. Uh, it's a lot of physics and stuff in construction. And then I had to come back and do chemistry and all that. So it took me three full years, six full semesters to do all my classes to get my degree in dietetics. So I would basically do giant international tours during the summers. And then just uh, I, each winter break, I would take a quadrant of the United States. So I did my very first one was Northwest USA. Uh, the next winter was Southwest USA and then Southeast, since I only had like three weeks during Christmas break. But then during the summers, I would just go on long ones. Like uh, one time I did an Australia tour. Uh, the next year I did like an 18 country tour. It was just, uh, just crazy. And that was the funny thing is, is I wasn't really making too much money. Uh, at the time because I was splitting it with all the people helping me and so I was taking out all the loans I could for school and then using all the extra money to pay for my summer tours and then finally Facebook monetized in uh, June and then uh, June 2018 and then everything got good from there so that was great but as far as uh, where I was going with that to answer your actual question I would pretty much just be off dieting during the school semesters so that I was able to exercise pretty much every day or at least five, six days a week while eating lightly so that any weight I gained during the tours, I was able to lose during my semesters at school. 
And I, I guess like talk, talking specifically because I think you're like a, you're uh, in your YouTube videos and all these different things you talk ov obviously also about a lot about fitness. And um, I know, and I've, I've not, I've never spoken, but I've like follow a few other, like, you know, either competitive or professional eaters in the past. And one thing that I noticed is like, obviously there's, they do sometimes have exercise routines, not every one of them. Um, so what does like look like for you? How do you balance it out? Like, you know, to make sure that you kind of have, and then do you even exercise when you're actually doing even tours or food challenges or that kind of time, or you just kind of reserve it for the time frame in which you're going to be like, okay, I'm going to take a little break here and then. It all kind of depends. So the United States is a lot different than when I'm on uh, international tours because the United States I'm driving all over. Mm -hmm. And so the, the food challenges sometimes aren't as clumped together. So the more time I have to travel and do all that, the less time I have to exercise because I still have to do everything for the videos and stuff like that. Uh, the Australia tour was the most convenient because Australia is just set up so that everybody's in big cities. We would just basically fly to a new city, stay there for a week, and then do it all over again in another one. But since I wasn't traveling anywhere, I was able to exercise pretty much every day. When I'm on, uh, when I'm on international trips, Most of my exercise is just out sightseeing. I'll, we'll stay somewhere around the downtown main central area and just, I'll just a couple hours a day, just walk around everywhere. Uh, it's just too much to try to find different gyms and pay $10 fees and all that kind of crap. It's just no fun. When I'm in the United States, I do have a Planet Fitness membership, uh, but mostly it's for showering and stuff like that since uh, I'm more of a free weights person. Um, and now I have a spin bike. I just actually, this March, this past March, uh, knowing how much I gained in 2019, uh, filming four videos a week um, for the channels, I bought a really nice stationary bike, and then I have a van that I'm going to be able to transport the bike in. So I'm going to be trying to, during our upcoming trips, I'm going to be trying to average about 10 to 12 hours of spinning uh, each week, in addition to doing other things here and there. Uh, just because I've been to all 50 states now and there's not really too much sightseeing else that I need to yeah, do. Yeah, of course. So um, that's not as uh, big of a, a a priority for me. Okay, that makes sense. Now, let's actually circle back around like 2019 because I think it sounds like obviously it was like your busiest year as far as like doing food challenges. Um, and you mentioned that you gain a little bit of weight like throughout that entire process. Like, I guess like I have a few questions about that. Like number one, like, like do you like how much weight that you kind of like, gain in the process? And, and I and also I'm super curious to know what is like the average like calories that you would consume on like one of those challenges because i've obviously i tried to like calculate it uh there's a time that i went i'm not sure if actually you've been there but i went to this place called uh um in i forgot the name it's like a burger place it's in this place in costa rica called Haco, and they had this like massive burger tower uh, i didn't know about that but i've never been to costa rica that's okay. uh, for 2021 if everything calms down Good. Okay. So like, so one of the things that I, I try to calculate the amount of calories of like the entire burger and actually came down to be like closer to like six or 7,000 or something like that for like the entire thing. Like number one, like, do you ever like calculate those things just for like, you know, for shits and giggles and like for you to know exactly how much you're kind of like taking in. Um, and if so, like, what is like the average of what you would need normally consume one of those challenges? A lot of people do ask about calories and I don't really get into it. Uh, just because it's so easy to be inaccurate. Yeah, of course. And then a lot of YouTubers, they overestimate. Like they're always quick to say, oh, 10,000 calories or 8,000 calories, or they even overestimate the pounds. Like, oh, it's an eight pound challenge when you know, realistically, it was like six or something. So I never really yeah. wanted to go down that path. But I would say, I mean, I've done some challenges that were probably, uh, I mean, hell, I did a seven pound sandwich one time that was mostly fried foods with mayonnaise. So, I mean, <laughs> that had to have been a couple thousand for sure, but it always depends. Like I've done a challenge. It was 17 biscuits with like uh, 70 ounces of gravy. So, I mean that, that, I don't know how many calories are in sausage gravy, but that's yeah. not fat free. That's for sure. But I would say the average is uh, probably four to four to 5,000. Okay. So, I mean, nowadays, um, Earlier on in my career, I was able to get away with doing some easier challenges. But now if I do challenges under like four and a half pounds, my subscribers are so used to seeing big challenges that they'll give me crap about it. Like, come on, Randy, what are you doing that for? <laughs> you got to challenge yourself. It's not fun to watch you eat. 
uh, four and a half pounds because they know the results before I start. So which, which has been, I'm, I'm super like curious to know this, like that the toughest in your entire like career doing this, like the toughest challenge you've ever done. And you're like, I almost like didn't even do it. I've done a, I've done a couple. Uh, let's see. First of all, my goal before I retire, and this is going to be probably after my dietetic internship, because I'll basically have to diet and just be focused on my internship for like seven or eight months. My goal is to do at least one or two 10 pound challenges. I've never done any 10 pound challenges, but I've done a couple that were around nine to nine and a half. So uh, there's one in Newcastle, Australia that I did that was like three food challenges in one. So there's usually most food challenges are bigger and they're free if you win. But then there's other restaurants that just more have promotional things where you still pay for it if you win, but you get like a certificate of achievement or they'll throw in a t-shirt or something like that. I tried to do three pay to play challenges all in one sitting. And the restaurant said if I finished them, they'd let me have them all free. And it ended up being like nine, nine and a half pounds, two big burritos, and then a dessert nachos platter. It was crazy. But by the time I got done with that, I was just hunched over any wrong move, any uh, try to speed up of the process or anything like that, I would have thrown up. So, I mean, that was, that was a rough one. And then I did a nine pound sopapilla challenge, a Mexican food thing in Albuquerque, New Mexico. That was crazy too. So your challenges are mostly on, on poundage and, and food. It's not necessarily, or do you also do like, like challenges that are not necessarily poundage, but it's more like spicy or. Like I can do things. spicy. I just don't really enjoy them. Back in 2010, I did a Trinidad Maruga scorpion pepper wings challenge which kind of still haunts my dreams today. <laughs> I had like rashes all over my face. <laughs> I, oh, it was terrible. So nowadays I don't really do anything hotter than ghost peppers, uh, but I will. Uh, I just don't because they just mess up your stomach. And uh, if one didn't sit right, I'd have to sit the next day off. And I usually try to do a challenge a day on my tours. And yeah, so, I mean, awesome. it's, it's one thing, I mean, it's, I'll, I'll be the first to say it's not healthy to eat seven pounds of food, but to have a whole bunch of basically scalding lava going down your esophagus into your <laughs> stomach, that's not good either. So, and I guess like with that, like, and you mentioned the, the word healthy, I'm, I'm sure like you get a lot of like criti criticism, um, you know, when it comes on to it, specifically like from like the, the health community or like nutrition communities and stuff like that. So, I guess like number one, so what are some of like maybe the, some of the misconceptions that people typically like see or like they, that it kind of exists in, in this world that we're in, like, like us outsiders that we don't really do this food challenges often or stuff like that. Some of those like typical misconceptions that like always kind of like that you typically tend to see often. Uh, I'd say the most ignorant comment that we get is just uh, not really ignorant. It's a lot of it's trolling too. But I'll do like a like an 18 scoop ice cream sundae or something, and people are like, oh my gosh, you're gonna give yourself diabetes. But diabetes doesn't come from one freaking meal. So, uh, but you can always follow my tours. Like if I do like I think one summer I did like 80 challenges, uh, just because I knew I needed a lot of videos to build myself up. I mean, you can see from day one versus day 70 my face, my body in general, especially if I do a big challenge and I have to stand. I mean, the, the gut is definitely there. So uh, we get more comments more and more as the tour goes on about my weight. Wow, Randy, you're really letting yourself go and stuff like that. In 2019, it was a big year. We grew by over 300,000 subscribers on both YouTube and Facebook too. So a lot of those people watched me grow <laughs> literally Quite during nice. all the challenges but they they were new to everything and they didn't go back to see all the previous tours where i start the tour lighter and the tour bigger and then i take months off and start the next big tour lighter again so if you don't see that i uh try to at least have some kind of moderation then people will comment like we actually had a, quite a few people actually at the end of last year uh, say that they stopped watching the videos because they felt that they were supporting an eating disorder. Um, really? Which I guess is, uh, I mean, you can't, I mean, a lot of those people already have their mind up. So there's no really, there's no real point in arguing with them. It's just thank them for watching the videos they did. And 
uh, they're welcome to watch videos in the future. So, I mean, I've been yeah. on the same track since 2012, really, and I've always kept on it and will always keep on. So that's another good thing is is the, the trolls and the people that uh, are more negative, uh, they realize that I'm always going to keep on doing what I'm doing regardless. Uh, and so yeah. if we don't really feed them, uh, they just kind of leave and go elsewhere. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I'm actually also interested to hear what, what did like, uh, did you ever like tell your teachers when you were like completing your dietetic coursework and everything about what you did or like, did they knew about it? Like, you know, what was like those kind of conversations like, or like, did they ever ask you about like that kind of stuff? All of the teachers definitely knew. <laughs> uh, I mean, cause I have a loud voice in general and uh, there was, I mean, I'm sure you know this, but I mean, we're dominated. So every class was just me and another guy. And then uh, sometimes two or three guys, if we were, or yeah, two, other three, two or three other guys, if we were lucky. My graduation class was like 30 gir like 27 girls and three guys. Yep, that's my And so, uh, and I don't know if it's a, an age thing or whatnot, but I'm used to, uh, in construction management, um, we used to talk all the time. Uh, with, like in classes and, and give feedback and teacher would ask a question. I mean, there'd always be somebody to answer. Nowadays, uh, and I don't know if it's nowadays or just the dietetics in general, but everybody's so quiet. And so I was always just known as the loudest person. If nobody answered and I knew the answer, I would just say it. And so I was always, I mean, everybody knew who I was in all the classes just because, hell, I'm 10 years older than everybody. Uh, <laughs> I started back at 30 years old, uh, basically construction management and dietetics were completely flipped. When I was yeah. in construction management, it was 95% uh, guys and like two or 3% women. But now in dietetics, it was 95% women and then just two or three guys. But I was still probably louder than all, all the girls combined. And what did you think, or what did like your teachers or people like obviously like think about your lifestyle? Or, like they call what kind of like what you did as far as like professional eating, or like did you ever kind of like, get even from like the within the nutritional community, like you know, oh, yeah. kind of backlash and stuff? No, not really backlash, uh, just because they learn quickly that I'm fairly stubborn and I'm going to do what I uh, intend to do. Um, but my first teacher uh, that we're good, we're great friends now, uh, well, at least I think we are. Um, I mean, I, we don't keep in touch, but we were great in classes and stuff, but she was talking about how I was going to have to delete my channel before I become a dietitian because I'll make a mockery of dietetics. And I basically just told her that there's a, uh, I don't know how it's possible mathematically, but a less than 0% chance of that happening. <laughs> and, uh, but I mean, all the other, it all depends on how old school you are. Yeah, uh, that's what I, I mean, consider. This is, this yeah, is definitely right. not a new, this is definitely not a, a new thing. This will be a new path that I'm, yeah. that I'm working on. And that's, but all that's, the other teachers were basically understanding of the potential that everything I've got going uh, will have for, uh, I guess, the field of dietetics. Because like I said earlier, there are no dietitians on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, there's a couple with over 100,000 on, on uh, Instagram, but we are getting, and I say we, not that I'm a dietitian yet, but dietetics is getting its butt whooped by the fitness industry as far as getting nutrition information out to the people that need it. Is that why you joined or why you decided to become a dietitian in the first place? You just to try to like, or what was actually that, that kind of like that moment when you decided like, Hey, you know what? Like I, I want to become like a, a nutrition expert or somebody within like, you know, credential on this. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And uh, in 2012, I did another body transformation uh, kind of for my own. It wasn't really part of a contest or anything. And I was telling a guy about uh, kind of the thought processes and everything behind what I was doing. And he's like, oh, Randy, you need to expand on that. I think there's a lot of potential and stuff. And so I actually thought more about it. And I started writing a book and putting together kind of a, it's more of a nutrition education system that I've been working on since 2012. And then in 2015, uh, as I got more into writing it and stuff like that, I started looking into what I would need to do to kind of have credentials and give myself more of a backing from an educational standpoint. And I looked around and quickly realized that anything less than becoming a dietitian is just kind of half-assed. So, I mean, there's different online things that you can do and, and all that, but uh, I mean, becoming a dietitian is the gold standard of, of everything. And uh, I don't really like to go anything 90%.
Yeah. So if it's worth doing, it's worth going 100%. So I decided to go back to school and invest all the time and everything it takes to become a dietitian and still on that route and definitely happy with the decision. Well, they do. When I heard about you, like I, I and I, I told you at the beginning, I consider myself like unconventional dietitian because I don't really go by like the old school standards and stuff like that. So I, in my case, I was like, I want to bring this guy in the podcast because I think also it, it comes down to perception, right? So like I, when I look at your YouTube channel and all these different things, like some people on like the old school world or like they actually some like the people that go against this kind of stuff because it's kind of like the people that are saying about the eating disorders. I look at it more as an opportunity to teach people like, hey, like, yeah, this is not maybe the way that every like the average person would live to do food challenges week to week. But it's also kind of like teaching from my perspective as a dietitian, like, hey, like one bad meal is not going to like completely destroy everything that you accomplish. And you mentioned this stuff about diabetes. And I think there's such a big misconception around this. You know, I don't know if you see this often and obviously you're probably going to be teaching it as well, but that's obviously the bigger problem that I think exists. And like people like I have clients sometimes like reaching out to me and they're like, Oh my God, I ate, um, you know, like four slices of pizza last night. <laughs> and now obviously I'm talking to you. Yeah. It's like, like, so, so what how do you like what are your thoughts on this like i guess yeah it's, like, it's instilled to everybody i mean that check out i mean instagram posts and stuff like that but no i mean hell we could talk for 24 hours easy about all the different stuff that needs to be improved but um a lot of people view me now so i'm i'm not, right now i'm like 300 310 pounds still doing food challenges and they think about what i'll be doing as a dietitian and stuff but when I'm a dietitian, I'm going to be weighing about 245. So I'm not going to be this big. I'm going to be retired from food challenges. And I'll only, be, I'll only be focused on everything that I'm doing. Using all of my food challenges is basically a resume of, of not only do I have the education behind it, but also the weight management experience. Because uh, that's a lot of things that that's a, lot, that's a big reason a lot of people struggle with relating to dietitians. It's mostly white males or not white males, white females that have never been big. Yeah. And so a lot of people aren't really quick to, I guess, relate to people like that. Um, they don't want to listen to somebody that, that they feel doesn't really relate to them as far as their past experiences. So people will be able to watch our videos and, and I mean, my, like you talked about earlier, my blood levels and stuff, um, I mean, I don't publish those. I don't get them done right after I get done with the 70 food challenge tour. I mean, I take a couple weeks off uh, to make sure that I have time to get my A1C back uh, under a normal range or, or something that looks pretty. But, um, but no, yeah, I mean, when I become a dietitian, uh, just even if I became a dietitian today, uh, I'd still be the most followed dietitian in the world on social media. So I still have like two more years before that happens. So I'm uh, going to try to get a couple more million people on board before I make the switch over. Yeah. And then uh, once that happens, um, I mean, even, I mean, some people might drop off that only follow the food challenges, but the potential, uh, to educate. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, the potential of uh, my reach is just going to be crazy. Yeah. And then not only exciting. just the reach in general, but uh, uh, just as far as a business side, uh, I mean, it takes money to accomplish goals. Uh, if a if a food company or something wants to do a sponsored video with a dietitian, they're only going to have one person to do to work with, other than some of the ones they do on Instagram. Yeah. And I think your background is just like fascinating because of the resume you built as far as like what yeah. you're doing. And I think well, I always try awesome. to maximize my integrity too. Uh, yeah. So that's one thing I'm trying to bring along with me. Uh, definitely never going to sell out to, to just doing things for money. Yeah, that's awesome, dude. Now you did mention and you talked a little bit about health and I watched one of like, you know, before like I didn't do a little research this morning on everything you've done. You did actually have a, a video, a YouTube video where you posted your, your blood work results. And I was like looking at it, like not necessarily expecting that your blood work was going to be bad, but I was like, it was actually, there was some improvement. So can you share a little bit more about like how your health is nowadays, or at least like when you were doing those comparisons, as far as like some of like the, the values that you looked at and some of the specific things and kind of like sharing with the audience, like, okay, how was it kind of like changed over time? Um, because I think it was super fascinating to me to look. Yeah, through. definitely. Yeah. I think it was 2016 that I did it or maybe 2017. But uh, after a semester was over before I left on a summer tour, I had taken all that time to diet and exercise and get my blood levels and my cholesterol and everything back in full check. So I got 
my blood levels tested and everything and everything was great. So I published the results. Well, like I said, I got big last year. And then so I ended up taking the first three months of 2020 off in order to do, uh, I call my diets uh, sexifications. <laughs> and it's just I saw it. I was going to ask you about it. I was like, where does yes. that work come from? Yes. Yeah. No, I started doing that many years ago. It's just like, it's just a more fun way to look at it. Hey, I'm going to work getting, getting my sexy back. Good so look make it of a thing. <laughs> uh, which it's always funny to hear people, uh, to people that don't remember that they're sex vacations, whatever they call them in comments and stuff like that. Yeah. That's always funny. But I figured as a way to cap off my 12 week little diet period before I started back with food challenges again, I went and got my blood levels tested again. And uh, I figured uh, after giving them off, I would relate them or compare them to 2016. And some of the, I think A1C went down and a couple others went down too. And the ones that did go up uh, was like triglycerides and, and stuff where I still had plenty of room uh, to still be within normal limits. Which is fascinating because like, I think this is something that you like manage because I, I think for you, like for weight management for you, it's not something hard. Like if you decide you want to do it, which I think it's like something that makes you different with, or what many people sometimes that you struggle because they're like, I struggle so much with losing weight for you. Like if you decide that today you want to actually drop a few pounds or whatever you decide to do, it's, it, it sounds from what you're saying that it's just not really, di I mean, not difficult as far no, as like, you it's, know what it's, to do. It's very easy for me. And that's actually one of my crutches is that, uh, sometimes I do get a little bit carried away because I know how easy it's going to come off. Yeah. So okay. when I'm focused on a goal, uh, not that I'm like John Wick or anything, but I go after it. And yeah. so that's actually, uh, the, what you just talked about is the whole reason I'm actually doing all this is that, uh, at least in my opinion, the big problem as far as nutrition education goes is not only do people not get a nutrition education, but what they are learning is just way too advanced and people don't even understand the fundamentals. So people are teaching other people about keto, low carb, and all this other crap, and people have no idea what any of that means. They just don't know any better. But they and still follow the it. If you don't know the fundamentals, you're not able to know the advanced stuff either. So my goal is, is to be help people understand the basics, the fundamentals relating to them in a way that they can easily understand. And then if they want to, once they have a base education, they can move on from there to other people. Yeah. And I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, dude, because I call them advanced nutrition strategies. When I'm like looking at, for example, things like intermittent fasting, keto and all these different things, like that's like next level stuff. I'm oh, not yeah. Like, yeah. Like, and that's like, you know, why would you actually try to do something so like, you know, too intricate and complicated before you understand what a carbohydrate is? And yeah. When you don't even know the difference between a simple and a complex carbohydrate is. Yeah. And, and I think that's obviously the bigger problem that people try to kind of find this like quick because it sounds like fancy, right? So it doesn't really yeah. kind of sound too, 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 too complex for them. So that, that obviously kind of like makes sense. Now from like the, the, the food challenges standpoint, cause I want to kind of circle back around things and ask you a couple more, a couple of questions on this. Like what are some of like the bigger drawbacks that you kind of see from, from doing this or some of like, I guess when you kind of start to establish like pros and cons and things that sometimes are difficult for you to be able to do, like whether it's physically, emotionally, like mentally, uh, when it comes down to some of these food challenges. Well, the biggest emotional problem is uh, when I'm really big. Cause I, I know that I know what I can look like. I mean, cause I've had a six pack, eight pack twice. Not that I want to maintain that. That's not really maintainable. I would have to be super boring to do that. But I mean, when you're up to, I was at 375 pounds uh, in 2019. I mean, your whole body just aches and feels like garbage. And so just knowing what you look like wearing a three X shirt and, and stuff like that, uh, that's just rough on the emotions. Um, so just knowing what you could be and what you're at, uh, it's just being able to survive all that I'd say would be the, the toughest uh, emotional part. But um, but I've always known why I'm doing it. And so that, that always makes things, e that makes things easier. Um, ask your question again. I was going to say something and then I already, well, I forgot. it's just more about like the, again, like some of the drawbacks or like the, when you look at pros and cons, like some oh, of the cons yes. of doing exactly what you're doing. Yes. Okay. So the problems that I have are the same that Adam Richmond had on man versus food. And so I don't think he's ever 
specifically said it, but just from a bystander's uh, perspective. So Adam Richman was, uh, have you watched Man vs. Yeah. Food? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So he was doing these food challenges, but I mean, it was like a weekend thing where he's in a specific city filming all these, filming the episode. So not only was he doing the food challenge, but he was filming at two other restaurants and eating some food at the restaurant where the food challenge was at. And so almost, you can almost call it, I guess, intermittent fasting if you really want to call it that. But uh, when you're only doing the food challenges, that's one thing. But uh, I mean, I love beer. Beer is delicious. I love sweets and desserts and stuff. And so when you add on the sweets and the beer and the desserts and other foods that other people give me, like there's some subscribers that make me, uh, my favorite dessert is gooey butter cake. It's a St. Louis thing. Or they'll make me cookies or something like that. When you're eating a whole bunch of foods in addition to the food challenges, that's when the weight really starts creeping on. So it takes a lot of discipline to be able to say no to all that uh, in order to only do the food challenges, get your necessary working out done uh, whenever you whenever you have time. So I would say that's the that's the hardest thing to balance. And then Adam Richmond, uh, in addition to all the food that he was eating, plus the food challenges, I don't really think he was taking too much time off in between filming seasons to actually lose the weight. So yeah. thankfully, I do that. Uh, but that also, sure too, the difference between us is I'm from an athletic background. Um, the reason that the show was successful is because he had more of a drama background, was more suited to be a TV show host. So I played sports all my life growing up. Uh, at one year, I think like in grade school, I was playing like five different sports. I played three sports my freshman year of high school uh, and then switched to just football and men's volleyball. Do you think there's an advantage of that in the way that your body kind of uh, like readjusts to like when you actually have to like try to lose weight, you know, compared to, for example, somebody that may not have that background? And in my back of my mind, I feel like obviously people with athletic backgrounds, they kind of sort of like the, the developmental stages of like, you know, improving yourself as an athlete, I think can kind of like help in a way. Do you think that kind of gave you or gives you sort of like an advantage in the process of like when you need to lose weight at some point? I think there's definitely muscle memory, uh, but I'm also a big fan of uh, the set point theory. What's that? The set point theory, it's basically where your body wants to be a specific weight. Okay. And if you're well above it or below it, it uh, adapts to help you achieve that goal. So, I mean, my body didn't want to be 375. And I mean, the people on The Biggest Loser, they don't want to be up where they're at or 400 or whatnot. I mean, that's why when you're really big, you have a lot of room for improvement. Your body doesn't want to be up there. And so those first couple weeks when you're actually make your behavior changes to eating better, working out more, I mean, the weight just falls off. So, I mean, my first couple weeks of, of 2020 losing the weight, I mean, I was gaining, I was losing like five, 10 pounds a week. Um, yeah. So, but then also as you get closer to your design weight or your set point or whatever, it gets a lot harder. And what's like your strategy? Like, I guess like, you no know, diving deeper, like let's say when you started just like your, your last sexification kind of like to 12 week process, like, you know, what does your day typically look like? How did you adjust your diet? And, and, and what is like the, maybe like what a typical day may look like maybe right now? I don't know. Well, I, I think you're back to food challenges or not, but you're kind of like outside of that. I'm on a week. Process. I'm on a week break. So okay. yeah, I mean, right, right now it's, I'm going to be, I'm um, going to be trying uh, my, my buddy, Scott, that I graduated dietetics with, uh, he's already a dietitian now, which is awesome. He just passed the test, uh, like a month ago, but he got me into biking. I love, st- uh, cycling, spinning. It's just a very efficient way, uh, to do cardio and burn calories. And also while I'm doing it, I'm able to kind of get my reading in. I listen to audio CDs and stuff like that. So that, uh, in addition to weightlifting when I can and, Doing stuff around the house is my main form of exercise. Uh, like when I, I do have a, a gravel bike now so that I can ride outside, but I can't really bring that on my trip. So I'll have to just bring my stationary yeah. bike uh, that I named Stacy. But I'll be, try, I'll be doing probably 10 to 12 hours a week uh, of biking uh, in addition to whatever little stuff I can. So that's going to help. Uh, when I'm doing that while uh, not doing food challenges, I have to still eat plenty because I've got to have the the energy to actually do the rides. 
So and what does your uh, typical day look like? Like just, you know, not necessarily too much detail, but for example, what is like your typical breakfast, lunch, type of dinner, type of thing that you typically have? On, like, and, uh, I've got a video on out. this uh, on my channels because uh, during my sexification, it was a 12 week process. Uh, each week on Fridays, we posted a video where I discussed a different aspect of what I was doing and then gave an update about how my progress was going. Nice. But I would say, uh, I mean, I, it's a big, I mean, there's no, there's not too much dietary fiber in my food challenges. <laughs> so when I'm home and, and on a break, I'm giving my digestive system a break and helping it clear out as well. So uh, usually breakfast is like oatmeal. Uh, I have wheat bran in my oatmeal sometimes or else uh, – eggs, uh, a lot of peppers, and uh, uh, some beans, stuff like that. And then uh, lunch is usually a lot of vegetables and uh, some lean meats and stuff like that. And then uh, dinner just kind of depends on uh, whether or not I'm riding or, or whatnot. Nice. Okay. Yeah. It just kind of like gives you a good, good a, a, sort of like a good perspective on like what your typical kind of like day looks like specifically. Yeah. It's basically the opposite of my food challenges. <laughs> That's awesome. People good, ask me a lot if there's any healthy food challenges, but uh, I just say no, because nobody would want to do it. I mean, what I'm only, only people that do food challenges have ever thought about eating a seven pound salad. It's not something that normal people do. And restaurants have to cater their food challenges to what normal people would want to do. Yeah. Can you Otherwise, imagine that? Like a, se a seven pound salad challenge? <laughs> uh, there, I've heard of one, but it was in California and I haven't been there to do it. And I, <laughs> That's probably I think the restaurant like a, might be you'll closed get your, now. You get your fiber in there for sure. <laughs> that is, yeah, definitely. A lot of healthy vegetables. Good, man. Awesome. Well, we're kind of coming to, towards like the end of it. And I want to make sure to like a link up to like a lot of the show notes for like, you know, for people listening to a lot of your YouTube videos, because they're super like enlightening and, and, and really interesting to kind of like see all that. Um, I guess like a few extra like last minute questions that I wanted to also ask you is going to be like, what do you see yourself in like, um, and you kind of mentioned a little bit more about what you want to do, but, and I know you're planning to retire like within a couple of years or so, at least after you kind of get your RD credentials. So what do you see yourself kind of like going to, um, in like the next like five to 10 years or so? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So my, uh, my nutrition education system or, or book that'll publish, uh, a couple months, hopefully maybe a year, everything always takes longer than you think, uh, after I'm a dietitian, but I will, uh, I'll basically be going from, uh, doing everything, my food challenges, traveling for food challenges to traveling as a public speaker. So, and uh, the main thing is, is I'll be the number one, uh, or I'll be working towards being the number one social media dietitian. And so then I'll have some people helping me, uh, helping to grow the presence of dietitians on social media, uh, gathering some others and helping them grow their stuff as well. Um, nice. And then trying to, uh, I mean, helping some brands as well. Uh, anybody that's focused on helping to to improve general basic understanding of nutrition and weight management uh, through social media, uh, I mean, a lot of most people, uh, I mean, they're not reading books anymore as much. They're uh, they're wanting to just get on their phone and watch a simple video. Yeah. So uh, that's going to be one of the goals is to help people get a basic understanding of general nutrition knowledge. Uh, just through their phones. So we'll be doing that through my Facebook and YouTube channels. And then uh, definitely not TikTok, but uh, whatever social media comes up, we'll be, uh, we'll be getting on those too. Awesome. Oh, well, that's, that's great. And great to hear, man. Well, we want to appreciate you actually being taking the time today. The last thing that we always do in this podcast is what we call our rapid fire questions. This okay. is going to be like the quick things that we can, so we can kind of like end up on a, a super cool note. So uh, you ready for them? Yeah. Awesome. Question number one would be, what is your favorite type of like movement or exercise or like even like type of movement, whatever you may do? I can't do them when I'm really heavy, but I love uh, pull-ups. And awesome. then number two would be squats. Okay. I like that. And I'm guessing now you're adding biking into the mix as well, right? That's my favorite cardio. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I, I, once I can do my, I've never been able to do 10 pull-ups. Uh, once the, on the day I can do 10 pull-ups, my social media will know about it. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you at right now? Is it like, what, four or five, maybe? Oh, hell no. I don't even, I can maybe do two right now, being 300 pounds. I mean, when I do 10, it's, I'm going to be probably under 250. Okay, awesome. Second question would be I'm not, I'm not going to be on American Ninja Warrior anytime soon. <laughs> 
Well, I wouldn't be surprised with like, you know, the amount of grit and like, you know, drive that you have for like a lot of this stuff that you're doing. So like, you know, who knows? Never say never. Yes. Agreed. Um, second question would be, what is like a book or, um, sort of like reading that you feel like you would gift to somebody like that everybody should have on their bookshelf? It could be anything. Oh my gosh. Ooh, let's see. So uh, I mean, hell, everybody always talks about think and grow rich, but, um, definitely just stuff about mindset. Um, mm -hmm. is there any, any, any of the major, any of the major books about, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, shoot. Um, oh, law of attraction and all that crap. Okay. Uh, I think any, I anything that. about just, I mean, the, the mind is the strongest muscle. So, yeah. but also too big fan of Dale Carnegie. Um, influence the, others yeah how do we yeah how do we influence yep. and influence people love that yep. that's a common yeah one. uh that. anybody uh i'm a big fan of the five love languages uh gary chapman nice. um the four tendencies uh by a girl named gretchen okay uh, and then i a, never a heard of that others. one the other two that yeah it's uh it's and then uh there's a uh there's a book called grit that i really like too by who do you remember his name i don't know it's by a woman um i'd have to look it up Grit. Okay. Yeah, I look it up. Uh, oh, Angela Lee Lee Duckworth. I think it's her name. Yeah. Yes, Duckworth. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I just got. I just got on Google too to look it up. Cool. All right. Well, I'm gonna be sure we kind of link in those in the in the show notes. Now, the third question would be: Is there any specific? And you can definitely have a shameless plug in there for either YouTube channel, like podcast, uh, or anything that you recommend people to kind of listen to, to learn, uh, to to entertain themselves, like something that you would like always like either listen to or something like that, even. You've just your own channel, of course. I mostly do audio books, uh, but if I'm ever going to do podcasts, uh, they're entrepreneurial related and he has different people. I mean, not everybody's going to like everyone, but uh, I'm a big fan of Lewis Howes. Okay. Yeah. He's a cool So guy. yeah, Lew Lewis Howes puts together uh, good stuff. Some of the nutrition minded people are absolutely nut jobs, <laughs> but, um, but overall, yeah. overall he does a great job. Okay, cool. Well, we'll then make sure we put that show uh, that link in the show notes as well. The last question would be, and I'm looking forward to your answer on this. If you were stranded for the rest of your life on a desertic island and you would have to choose one food, compound food or whatever, and one food only, what would you choose? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to looking forward to actually hear like Randy's response on this one. Taco Bell. <laughs> okay. Taco Bell one. to the death. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I love buffalo chicken as well. But uh, you can never go wrong with burritos. <laughs> Good, awesome. Is that your favorite food? Uh, well, buffalo chicken's my favorite flavor. Okay. Um, I would have to say my favorite food. Ooh. I, yeah, buffalo chicken pizza without blue cheese is probably my favorite. Good. Oh, that's awesome. Or else uh, it's a St. Louis thing. I love pork steaks. Those pork steaks good. and then uh, barbecued or rotisserie chicken thighs. Nice. Good. But the Taco Bell would definitely be the one thing that you would oh, actually yeah. love yeah. for the rest yeah. of your life. Taco Bell is amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Randy, it's, it's been a pleasure, man. How can people find you, hear about you, uh, reach out to you, talk to you? What are the best? As far as I know, there's only one Randy Santel. I've never seen or heard of another one. So if you just Google Randy Santel, actually this week I'm working on revamping my randysantel.com website. Uh, the main feature is going to have a map on there that shows absolutely everywhere I've been for a food challenge so that you can pull up the YouTube video. It'll kind of organize all of my social media better. But then anybody that is <laughs> probably not too much of this audience, but any questions about food challenges, uh, I do own and operate the website foodchallenges.com. Uh, but other than that, all my social media is Randy Santel, uh, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram are my main ones. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely get to add, add all those like links in the show notes for people listening to it and want to obviously see some of those awesome YouTube videos. Uh, you're definitely going to love it and join as much as I did. So, uh, Randy, thank you so much for, for taking the time here today, man, and, and looking forward to actually have this episode released. So everybody yeah, can... I hope to meet up with you at a fancy or something like that. Uh, we will. Men and sure. dietetics got to stick together. Yes. And maybe you can kind of teach me a couple of things in doing one of these food challenges because I'm really kind of like, like I've always wanted to do one, man. <laughs> it's a, it, they're, they're actually on a lot of people's bucket lists and that's kind of the thing is i get a i get crap sometimes from people saying that i'm promoting uh unhealthy eating or whatnot but most of the people that are quote unquote inspired to do a food challenge 
they're not becoming Randy doing 800 food challenges. They just want to do one or two for fun to say they did yep. and then go on with their lives. I may actually have to take you up on that. So I may reach out to you and let me know like, Hey, like what is like, have you done one in Tampa yet or no? Oh yeah. 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 I, uh, uh, one of my business partners lives in Tampa. So I've been there like six times. Which one is like the one that kind of, what, what kind of, what's the one that kind of pops in your head right now that you can think uh, If you were going to do one, Am I okay? Yeah, you yeah. Me? You kind of like okay. froze up, but you're good. Okay, yeah, there we go. Um, if I was going to do one, uh, if I was going to have you do a beginner one, it would probably, if it's still available, it eats. Uh, eats? It's a, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, a yeah, bar yeah. and eats. Uh, but also, too, there's a taco challenge in Clearwater, Florida as well. Okay. Um, but then if you like breakfast, uh, there's the Broken Yoke uh, in Carrollton, I think it is, or yeah. Carroll Wood it might be. Yeah, Carol. So there's there's quite a few food challenges there. It just kind of depends on what you like to eat most. Awesome. Yeah, the breakfast one sounds amazing. Yeah, we're yeah, definitely yeah, gonna let you know. Actually, I, uh, they're reasonable with their food portion. Nice. So I think I did it in like 12, 13 minutes without struggling too hard. So okay. it's definitely doable. <laughs> nice. Awesome, dude. Well, thank you again so much for being on the podcast and, and looking forward to meeting you in person at some point and through when, when this whole pandemic thing is over. Yes, uh, yeah. We'll keep in touch and then definitely tell your friend that uh, referred me that I said thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Randy, and have a great day, man. Hey, and thank you guys all for listening. I appreciate it. See you in the next one.